the clink the clink prison the clink prison museum london england this is the first episode of five dealing with the clink and along the way we're going to uh, engage in penal tourism and that is enter these prisons which are now museums for what I write about at length in the book Escape to Prison safe contact visitors want to go into these prison museums and imagine that they're in a real prison but in fact they're actually in a prison museum but they suspend their belief and that's at the essence of penal tourism now in this first photograph in the corner down here on the left this panel it says that there's going to be a free photograph with entrance and um, that is what I call foreshadowing because it's giving us some information in advance that will reemerge later in the tour and foreshadowing is an important part of prison museums because prison museums are storytelling institutions they tell us about itself as an institution but also the people that are incarcerated so with that I want to also remind you that the, the clique is located in South Bank near the Tate Modern Museum so if you find yourself in London make sure you make a point to put this this prison museum on your itinerary because um, as you can see over on the right hand side it's open till nine o'clock at night so you'll have plenty of time to get in do your thing take your own photographs engage in a little bit of nervous laughter with some of the items on display and then by nine o'clock you'll be able to get out go across the street on a nice pub and have a pint. So with that, I want to go on to the clink as your curator, as your tour guide. All right. And this is what you're going to see as soon as you enter the clink. And there's a lot going on in this photograph because you see an elderly woman who's obviously poverty-stricken and she's begging through the grate and these prisons at that time in, in England were deliberately designed to have these grates facing the footpath or the sidewalk where the prisoners had access to the public the public citizens residents local people walking by could identify with the plight of these prisoners and they could give them food they could give them blankets they could they could converse with them they could try to lift their spirits and let me point to a few things here that illuminate what else is going on we see this woman has a has a friend you follow the cursor, a rat, more foreshadowing, I'm not going to give it away. There's also some text. And these, these placards remind us that these prison museums have context. Within the gate, they cry at the grave, pray, remember our fate and have pity. Let's take a look at some of this information. Many prisoners had to beg in order to survive. And in the cells of the clink, 
street level gratings were thoughtfully provided for this purpose. Ordinary citizens did respond. In a cruel and chaotic age, no one could be sure that they might one day find themselves falsely imprisoned. Some brought food, clothing, and fuel to the gratings. Others left generous bequests to the prisoners in their wills. Like Henry VII himself left 2,000 pounds for charity, including 3,000 pounds for the miserable prisoners condemned for debt or other cause. A debtor's prison. It also reminds us that locking up poor people is as old as the prison itself and we have not escaped that legacy. And here you go. Now if you watch old gangster movies, and I do, you um, you might hear some of the jargon, some of the slang, and they oftentimes refer to the jail as the clink. But this clink in London, England, claims to be the first of its kind. This is the institution that gave the jail the name of the clink. Because as you can see, there's a prisoner off to your left, standing next to a blacksmith, and the blacksmith has his hammer and he is attaching shackles, an iron shackle, on the anvil. And the sound is, of course, the clink. Now, more information. We've got some text here. Over here. Both the jailer and the inmates stripped him of his clothes, his money and his valuables. Note the clinching iron. And there you go. The clink. Now they had to pay the, the, the blacksmith to attach the shackles upon arrival. And upon departure, they had to pay him again to remove the shackles because they, they belonged to him. It was his own little shop making money off of prisoners. We still have not escaped that legacy. Now, I've studied prisons all over the world. Some of them are, are worthwhile to spend lengthy periods of time doing field work, but I have to say the clink is a dirty environment. It's a dungeon, it's subterranean, it's disgusting. I can say that after a day of two or three hours of field work here in the clink, I definitely needed a pint when I crossed the street. But let's go further in. And here you have more misery, people shackled, confined to this disgusting environment for long periods of time without medical attention, without adequate food, and that's the way it was. And in some cases, that's the way it still is in some prisons around the world. But let's look at some of the text that provides a little bit more insight. Children were regarded as miniature adults and hence often sentenced to prison. There are innumerable cases of women with children at breast being sentenced to prison and terrible tales of the sufferings of the mother and the children under the cruel keepers. Their case was hopeless from the start. Kids in cages, still with us. Kids in cages. In 1580, Jane Goldwar was imprisoned within the clink with five children. It's believed that she was also present, pregnant. 
records show them entering the prison but never leaving. The statute of Acton Brunel, 1283, allowed creditors to imprison their debtors until they paid the bills. The clique was founded for this source of misery to exploit poor people. It was known as a debtor's prison until the end of the century, witnessing the humiliation of countless men and women at the hands of sadistic creditors and jailers. The clink. And here you go. Let me magnify this so you get a chance to see what this instrument is all about. Look at that. This is called a brank. And it's forced onto the face over the head of certain prisoners. As you can see, there's openings for the eyes, the nose. It's somewhat decorated as a mask. But let's take a look at the text that explains this contraption. Look at that. My God. One of the things that I'm going to repeat throughout much of this course is that when it comes to thinking up new ideas to inflict pain and punishment and humili humiliation on another human being, there is no shortage of ideas. Scold's Bridle, also known as the Brank. One event that was always certain to attract attention was the punishment of the gossip or the scold, women using abusive language were not holding their tongues or just complaining of injustices had their mouths stilled by this means. It consisted of a small iron framework in the form of a cage which fitted tightly over the head and the eye holes and the opening for the nose. At the front, protruding inwards, was a small flat plate which was inserted into the offender's mouth and the bridle was then locked into position around the neck. Some models were quite painless to wear. That's easy for you to say. Some had large tongue plates studded with a sharp pin that could cause appalling injury. Things to do. Let me repeat. Things to do. These are storytelling institutions. And they are performing institutions. And their performance allows the audience, namely the visitors, the penal tourists, to engage in the performance. Things to do. Do you think this item might be used in your home if used today? So if your sister, your little sister is complaining about having too much homework, well, you could ask your dad, ask the old man if he wants to reach for the, the brank and attach it to your little sister. Is that the kind of house you live in? Well, maybe, maybe not. Think how the person would be able to eat or drink with this brank. Look at that. Uh. And here we are. The reason why these poles, the blades, are so long is to create distance between the sheriff, the police, members of the law enforcement establishment, to create distance from them and their targets, those they are arresting. Because at the time, these perpetrators, even if they were seemingly harmless pickpocket. They oftentimes were 
armed with knives and daggers. And members of the police establishment had to be very vigilant. And so oftentimes they used these poles with blades to create distance between the perpetrator and the police. I guess today we would call that social distancing. This concludes episode one. You can take a break, get a cup of coffee, come back for episode two. Cheers. <laughs>